Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. And today I am joined by my colleague and fellow analyst, Joe Peterson. Joe is also a member of our Cube Collective community of analysts. Joe, welcome. It's great to see you. You too. Great to be here. Absolutely. So today we are going to tackle the topic of cloud security trends that we see ahead in 2024. So for starters, to lay a little background, um, according to Security Today, global cloud spending is expected to grow more than 20% in 2024. We're seeing, of course, more organizations implement a cloud-first approach. No surprises there. But the reality of it is, is asset shift to hybrid and multi-cloud environments, security strategies need to shift too, and they need to be top of mind as those nasty threat actors are always looking for opportunities to exploit vulnerabilities across interconnected cloud deployments. Uh, some research from HelpNet Security pointed out that attackers are adapting as organizations adopt a cloud first approach. And you know what, that's happening across the board. And that's some of the things that we talk about in this series. I mean, you know, threat actors are highly motivated. Um, doing dirty deeds is incredibly financially rewarding. And so they are as trying to stay as far ahead of the curve as humanly possible, right? So as we continue to see mass migration to the cloud, cyber criminals are going to follow suit. We know that in 2024, we are going to see an increase in sophisticated cyber attacks targeting cloud architecture, cloud infrastructure. Um, we anticipate seeing attackers more frequently targeting newer cloud technologies like container-based and serverless resources. Data is going to continue to be recognized as not only the lifeblood of every business, but an invaluable asset of, and that is incredibly important. And we're gonna see attackers shift tactics to adapt as businesses move toward a cloud-first approach. The primary motivation, of course, is the amount of sensitive data that they can obtain from sensitive from data breaches. And, um, and that sensitive information, I mean, it could be personally identified, uh, in PII, personally identifiable information. It could be um, all different, it could be, um, uh, what am I thinking about? It could be proprietary data. It could be trade secrets. It could be all kinds of information that they could get access to. So this is really important. So the six cloud trends of 2024 that we believe you and your security team need to be paying a lot of attention to are zero trust model, implementing AI and ML for cloud, cybersecurity mesh, secure access server edge or SASE, automation of DevSecOps, and cloud native platform and tools. Oh my gosh, pretty soon I'm going to quit talking. So anyway, to quickly wrap this up and to toss it over to you, Joe, you know, I'm going to start with zero trust. And the concept of zero trust has been around since about 2020, 2010, when Forrester research analyst John Kindervag created the zero trust security model. Two years after the devastating colonial pipeline attack, and we've seen strong advocacy from the US government and others, we are still really no closer to seeing zero trust architecture wildly adopted. That is concerning. And the only exception it seems on that front as it relates to zero cloud architecture has been, the adoption of that has been with cloud service providers. So what do you think? Yeah, that's, I mean, absolutely. So let me, take a step back. I'm a huge fan of zero trust network access, replacing VPN technology because VPN is 20 years old and it really doesn't fit the way we work today, which is either hybrid or remote. Right. But implementing a zero trust stack is complex and can be complicated. So there was a great article by Henry Newman in eSecurity Planet and Henry asked the question, whether or not zero trust can be implemented outside of the cloud. And Henry made a couple assertions that I tend to agree with. Um, he said that the cloud service providers have a huge advantage over traditional hardware. So that means server and network and software vendors for three reasons. And here are Henry's reasons. He thinks that CSPs control the software stack. So they don't have to have network monitoring, multi-factor monitoring, OS monitoring, and they integrate, coordinate, and correlate everything between, you know, on, in their own stack. 
Yeah. The hardware stack is also controlled by them. So for the most part, the CSBs built their own hardware and they've been building their own CPUs, some of them. So they build their own network devices. Um, everything is integrated into that CSP's you know, supply chain, as it were, or stack. Yeah. And then he further says that the entry points are monitored closely. So when you connect to a CSP, everything is monitored by that cloud service provider. If you have a breach, they might know it before you do because there was some, you know, anomalistic behavior going on. They would see that first. And that's their job. (laughs) That's their job, right? So you're paying them for that, right? So if if we're looking at a zero trust architecture, back to, I do agree with him. Um, There have been really no publicized large hacks of CSPs other than the hacks that started by getting into customer sites, then to the CSP or databases left open by a customer, right? Right. So I, I kind of think that, yes, do zero trust network access. And there's some other things that you can do in a zero trust architecture, but you may want to really think about your bench and if you're able to pull it off. Yeah. Um, so, so the next trend that is in our list of six is AL, AI and ML. Um, and I don't know about you, Shelly, but I'm starting to feel like every cloud conversation that I have is really an AI ML conversation and it's starting to be a synonymous term. What is going on with that? Well, I, I absolutely agree. Um, that said, I'm going to go back a minute and touch on your point about VPNs. And, you know, in a prior episode of this series, we talked about the reality that, it, you know, VPN is old technology and, you know, VPNs recognize a device and that's no longer good enough on the protection front. Um, and a zero trust network is where it's at. And you know how you when sometimes I come across something that is such a great example that I just use it over and over and over again. Um, and, and one of these is is an example from a conversation that Zscaler's Jay Chaudhry had um, on the Cube. I think it was at VMware Explorer. I'm not exactly sure of the event, but I think that could have been it. But anyway, he gave such a great example illustrating why a VPN really isn't the best protection. And I and I love this. So I'm going to give you I'm going to give you this explanation again. So here's what happens when a user gets on a network using a VPN or or being on a network with Firepol firewalls. And here's how Jay described it. I come to visit you. I stop at the reception desk. They check my ID and they give me a badge and they go, hey, go inside. Your meeting's on the seventh floor. And you just walk in and you wander around and you go wherever you need to go. He's inside. He could snoop around. They wouldn't know if he went to where he was supposed to go, if he went to the restroom, if he went somewhere else. They don't know. So that's what happens with network security and a VPN. And that kind of gives me pause a little bit, right? That's why I love this example so much. Um, So in the zero trust model, you stop at reception, they get your ID, you get a badge, and then they say, come on, let me escort you to room, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And this is the only room you're escorted to, and it's the only room you're in, and you don't even know, (laughs) you know, you don't even know that you're in room 22. And once your meeting happens, they're going to escort you out. And, you know, and and then, you know, he went on to give the example, you know, if you're at someplace where they're really security savvy, like somewhere at the DOD, Pentagon, whatever, you know, they're going to say, hey, Jay, we're going to blindfold you. (laughs) We're going to take you to the meeting and then they're going to blindfold you again and take you out. And I just love that example because so many of us, I was, you know, every person on the planet hasn't experienced this, but the reality of it is most of us have walked into a corporate headquarters, an office building, whatever, given our ID, gotten our badge, and we can really relate to that example. So I I love that just clear way of thinking about a VPN and how it's not really the best protection anymore. So anyway, back to your question. Back in January, of course, we know Microsoft really rocked the technology industry and announced a $10 billion investment into OpenAI. Um, Amazon has invested in Anthropic in September, about $4 billion. That helped, of course, boost Amazon stock. And Google has invested about $2 billion in Anthropic as well. So we've seen a total of about $16 billion invested thus far. And by the way, I'm sure that's just a tip of the iceberg. But that's just for the tech. That's not for other capital investments like data center space and that sort of thing. So 
capital spending by Google, Amazon, and Microsoft has jumped to a combined $42 billion for the three months up to September, according to payments.com. So it's clear that, you know, to the point that you made, Joe, hyperscalers are investing in all things AI. And we're starting to see some guidance come out as it relates to end users about securing AI. And I will tell you, every conversation I have, whether it's with you, Joe, or with our clients or with somebody in the industry, AI security is top of the list and it's top of mind. And with good reason. I mean, everybody is thinking about or dipping their toes in or getting waist deep in all things AI. And, and you have to have a security posture around this. Um, it's just critically important. So anyway, um, I love the fact that we are seeing guidance come out about this. And, and I love the fact that we're seeing this attention on AI security. Yeah. I mean, I'm beating that drum all the time, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's daunting for the leadership, meaning many of them have had the, the forethought and the strategic awareness to put in policies for the employees, right? But the problem becomes enforcing the policy, you know? So, we're starting to see some great thought leadership come out from the hyperscalers. Um, back all the way back in January of 23, Google announced their secure AI framework or SAIF. Um, and it's a good look at what's important. So SAIF has six core elements. The first is expand strong security foundations to the AI ecosystem. The second is extend detection and response bring AI into its own organizations, or sorry, into an organization's threat universe. Third, automate defenses to keep pace with the existing and new threats. Fourth, harmonize platform level controls to ensure consistent security across the org. Next, adapt controls to adjust mitigations and create faster feedback loops for AI deployment. And then the last one is con contextualize AI system risks in surrounding business processes. Probably easier said than done. But Google is also drinking their own champagne. So they have taken five steps internally to support and advance a framework that works for all. And I'm sure that AWS and Microsoft are doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, organizations looking to chart a course, NIST has published a really beefy, I want to say it's 63 pages. I'm busy reading it. <laughs> AI risk management framework. And it is so chock full of great guidance that I suggest yeah. enterprise IT leaders read it. Um, I'm going to include a link to that in our show notes okay. for our That'd be great. viewing audience. I think that that definitely is something to dive into in your free time, as opposed to Netflix and chilling, you can, you know, AI risk management framework, chill. Or buying stuff like I do on Instagram. There's that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, well, I'm going to talk now a little bit about uh, item number three on our list, which is cybersecurity mesh. So this is a defense strategy that independently secures each device with its own perimeter, like firewalls and network protection tools. And, and many security practices use a single perimeter to ensure a, and to secure rather an entire IT uh, environment. But a security mesh uses a holistic approach. Gartner uh, coined this term, uh, security mesh architecture, CSMA. And as more assets are moved into a multi-cloud environment, it's, it's becoming so much easier for attackers to access them. And that's really why IT leaders need to start thinking about security as a platform where everything works together. And the answer, of course, is it lies in securing the right platform and consolidating tools where it makes sense. And, and you start by asking yourself, you know, how do we connect the different cybersecurity tools? CSMA gives you the ability to leverage a reduced vendor footprint, which is good, right? Um, I see that as reducing risk along the way, well, but also while deploying best-in-class solutions through this integration. Um, CSMA is a significant shift away from the traditional perimeter-based security models that we're familiar with, and it's, it's really shifting toward a more decentralized, device-centric approach to network security. 
And I think it's a it's a relatively new concept, but it's we believe that it's going to become more relevant and more uh, widely embraced as organizations continue to face cybersecurity threats that not only evolve, but grow at an exponential rate. Oh, yeah, totally agree. I mean, this is definitely a, a trend we're going to just be continued to see. Um, I think that overall CSMA pr- helps to provide a multi-layer defense against cyber threats, and it makes it more difficult for attackers to successfully penetrate an organization's network. So in case folks are wondering, there's five components because it is a newer tool or, or uh, an idea, a concept. Um, first of all, there's APIs. Um, second component is a really strong analytics and intelligence process. So think about everything disparate coming into more or less one place. Uh, distributed identity management, consolidated approach to policy management, and a really great dashboard. I love this one that everybody in the org can see and better understand. So instead of like all these little silo dashboards that give you a view into one thing, the idea is to give you a broader view across things, um, which I like. So yeah, if we move on to our fifth cloud security trend, um, we believe we're gonna see the automation, more automation of DevSecOps, and I'm I'm kinda here for it. <laughs> oh, I am as well. And you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a comment on um, visibility and dashboards and access to those dashboards across the organization. We did a research study a couple of years ago um, in partnership with Dell. And it, uh, some of the things that we asked in our survey was, you know, do you have visibility? Do you you use a dashboard? And um, we asked about instances of cyber attacks and how many cyber attacks on average they experienced and such and such time basis and everything else. And what was so fascinating and not at all surprising is that the folks who said they had not had any cybersecurity threat instances um, were generally speaking the folks who had no visibility. They weren't using a dashboard. They couldn't see what was happening across the organization in real time. And so they thought they were good. And conversely, the people in our study who did understand the importance of visibility and who were using dashboards were seeing they were they were having instances of, you know, uh, threat attacks on a regular basis and, you know, instance mitigate, instance mitigate, you know, and, and so, but it's just so interesting to me. Oh yeah, we, have, we don't have anything to worry about. We have no idea what's going on inside our network, but we're pretty sure we have nothing to worry about. And that scares the heck out of me. Yeah. Right. You know? That's, that's, that's how we get these, these really long dwell times. Just that. That is it. Absolutely. So DevSecOps automation the process of automating the integration of security into dev devops continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines uh, this automation is cool because it drastically reduces the number of errors that occur when security um, that i'm sorry it, it reduces the amount of errors when security analysis is performed manually makes perfect sense, right? And so while DevSecOps makes security a shared responsibility of devs and the operational team and security teams, DevSecOps automation empowers everyone and gives everyone the tools that they need to ensure that code and configurations are secure without the need of everybody in the equation becoming security specialists. There are a bunch of vendors in this space that have software available, people like Sync, Checkmark, Synopsys, GitLab, and Contrast Security. A really interesting, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see that list of vendors continue to grow, but this is really something that is evolving very quickly, and I think we'll see more of that. Yeah, and I'm encouraged because for the longest time, you know, I'm encouraged by a DevSecOps role to begin with because for the longest time we had silos, right? We had the dev folks, we had the op folks, we had the security folks, right? So the fact that everybody's coming together and swimming in the pool is a great thing because it means that we're putting security in the front of the process, right? Um, And that the thinking is that we're going to greatly reduce some of the, the time to deploy 
by, by doing, by being basically proactive. So the application security market in general has really taken off. Um, it's estimated to be 11.62 billion in 2024, and it's going to basically more than double that by 2029 at 25.92 billion. I mean, that's that's a lot of bananas yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's um, eventually doubling. You know, a little more than doubling in the space of five years. Yeah, exactly. But you know, last but not least uh, on our list. Um, for for cloud security predictions is cloud native platforms and tools. So any guess, Shelley, what the cloud native security market is worth and who some of the players are in that space? Well, you know, I don't need to guess because I've got some research in front of me from uh, Virtue Market Research. Uh, global cloud native platform market was valued at 9.77 billion and is projected to reach a market size of 35 billion by the end of 2030. So even more dramatic of an increase um, than the application security market. And by the way, um, if you're interested in application security and security, I would be remiss not to mention that we covered that topic in last week's show. So I will include a link to that in the show notes as well. So check that out if that's on your list. But I digressed. So projected to re reach a market size of 35 billion by the end of 2030. Um, this market over this six year period, it's the market is pro projected to grow um, about 20, 20%. The vendors in the in the space include some very familiar names, Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, Check, Checkpoint, Trend Micro. Um, this is, uh, again, a rapidly growing space and one we expect to see more movement in. Yeah, and I'm just like a little half a side prediction. I think we're going to get, uh, we're going to see a consolidation to what's known as CNAP, uh, Cloud yeah. Native Application Protection Platform, um, yeah. from some of these little point solutions that have happened over time out of necessity, it's just maturing, right? So well, that's, that's, you know, we saw that with Sentinel-1's purchase of PingSafe, yeah. right? Because they did. have a CNAP solution and that enhances Sentinel-1's offering. So you're abs I think you're absolutely right. You're always right. You're an engineer. Yeah. Once, oh, God, you know what? I need to record that and have you record that for my husband. For your You're husband? Honest. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. She's always right. I mean, perfect, right? Perfect. Well, those are our predictions for 2020, our cloud security predictions for 2024. That's it. Six cloud cloud security predictions. I will very quickly recap them. Zero trust model will become more and more important to begin to be embraced even more. And that's a good thing. We'll see the implementation of AI and ML for cloud, cybersecurity mesh, SASE, automation of de DevSecOps, and cloud native platform and tools. So with that, we're going to wrap our show, The Security Angle, today. And Joe, thanks so much for spending time with me. It's always a pleasure. For our listening and viewing audience, thank you as well. And we'll see you again next week.